We expect that people, uh, the institutions will not discriminate on the basis of race or sex or indeed class. Indeed, they're legally not allowed to do that now. Um, and we, whenever we smell nepotism or corruption, we are revolted by that. We think that it's just not acceptable um, to conduct affairs like that. But I think we have to recognize that this is a relatively new phenomenon that through most of human history, the assumptions that have driven the, 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 the world, the allocation of positions and uh, jobs have not been meritocratic. Merit mer meritocracy is a relatively new thing. If you look at the history of the West, you can see that merit meritocracy is relatively recent. If you look around the world, you can see that it's actually relatively confined to certain parts of the world. There are lots of parts of the world that are not meritocratic, that uh, are based upon very different sets of assumptions. And if you look into your own soul, you can see that meritocracy isn't a very natural human instinct. Most people want to do the best for their children, for their families, for people who are close to them. And they, they would be sort of rather inclined to rig the system. That's a very basic human uh, emotion. Indeed, a lot of uh, rigging behind the scenes, I'm sure, still still goes on. So meritocracy is new, it's fragile, um, and it's not something that is easy for humans to adapt to. And I think meritocracy, um, if you look at most of the history of Europe, let's say, it's based on a different set of assumptions. It's based on the assumption that the central institution in society is the family, that the central social organizing principle is subordination, willing subordination to the powers that be, and the idea that society is organized into hierarchies um, and that people are born into their appropriate position in society. That's, you know, if you look at Shakespeare, for example, it's absolutely interwoven with everything that Shakespeare writes, that there is an order to the world, that kings are at the top, that the plebeians are at the bottom, and that if you try and change that arrangement, people try and rise up the social hierarchy, that's a very disturbing thing, and, you know, if you think of Troilus and Cressida uh, talking about untune that string, i.e. the string of, of social hierarchy, and lo, what discord follows, you have massive discord following from that. And if you look at, again at, at society, society is hierarchically organized, people inherit their positions on the basis of, of birth, and jobs, positions in society are allocated on the by the mechanisms of patronage, nepotism, and indeed, um, buying and selling. So kings inherit their jobs, aristocrats inherit their position in society. They have a bunch of, uh, of jobs, which they give away on the basis of patronage, almost in the way that they're giving away gifts to people that they favor, often members of their own family. Um, and there's also, as well as patronage, there's of course nepotism, people, people getting jobs on the basis, literally on the basis of, uh, of their parents or their uncles, or you know, as the term nepotism would indicate. And there's also a lively market in buying and selling jobs. You know, if you look at the British Army, commissions in the British Army until 1870 would be bought on the open market and sold on the open market. So the notion that there is a, a natural link between getting a job and being able to perform that job, uh, being qualified, being intellectually able, being professionally qualified to do that job is a relatively new one. For most of human history, a job has been more like a piece of property, which you either own or inherit, uh, or which you, you, you give away. So, um, and there was no necessary connection between the ability that you had to perform the job and having the job. So uh, when I was writing my book, I was very amused to come across lots of examples of this. One example that particularly amused me was a woman, a woman called Margaret Scott, who in 1781 was earning 200 pounds a year to act as the wet nurse to the Prince of Wales. Now, 200 pounds a year in, 17, in 1781 was a great deal of money. It was also a great deal of money if you consider the fact that the Prince of Wales at this time was 21 years old. So, um, and I came across lots of examples of sinecures. Um, there was one person who was the permanent solicitor to the UK Treasury, uh, again in the 1780s, and he was sent a slight reprimanding letter saying, dear sir, um, we're slightly concerned that you haven't been to work for the past 40 years, and do you mind showing up at some point, you know, so we'd like to get a look at you. 
at least. So this notion of competence, performance, and qualification is new. It's a building block uh, of the modern world, um, and it's something that hasn't been around for most of history. Where does it come from? I think it comes from this fundamental transformation that is embodied in the Industrial Revolution. The society of aristocracy and of inheritance and of land is replaced by a much more dynamic society, and it's confirmed by a succession of revolutions. There's the American Revolution, which replaces what Jefferson calls the artificial tinsel aristocracy with the natural aristocracy of ability. There's the French Revolution, which is based on the idea of a career open to talents, everybody having a field marshal's baton in their knapsack, the notion that upward mobility is a natural part of the, the ordering of the world. And then there's the British liberal revolution, the Gladstonian revolution of the mid 19th century, which opens up jobs in the civil service to open competition, moderated by examinations. You have the same with Oxford and, uh, and Cambridge fellowships. Instead of being given away to people on the basis of family connections, whether they're founders, kins, kin, which meant that they're related to the founder of the college, whether they're a good chap, um, it's done on the basis of examinations. Um, you take an examination, and if you do well in the examination, you become a fellow of the college. Again, that's happening in the, in, in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, along with the open competition and civil service. And again, in the army in the 1870s, you move away from buying and selling commissions, again, to admission on the basis of, of, of examinations through professional qualifications with the founding of Sandhurst and, and, and things like that. And so you have elite positions shifting from being property that's basically controlled by the landed aristocracy to being jobs that you earn on the basis of merit. And this system begins to become much more self-reinforcing it's originally created for essentially upper middle class men. And that's what they mean by open competition. They mean competition to a group, confined to a group of upper middle class men. But it's gradually broadened to include women, uh, to include ethnic minorities, and to include members of the working class who demand that a ladder of mobility, a ladder of educational opportunities should be built from the bottom of society right up to the top of society. Again, to come back to the webs and the LSE, the webs are absolutely integral to this process. They demand two things. They say we must have more of a ladder of mobility for um, the masses. We must have a mass educational system. And we must have an educational system which celebrates useful knowledge, modern useful knowledge, rather than the sort of antiquated classical studies and clerical studies that was characteristic of Oxford. So they're trying to say both that we must have a broader base for the elite and a new elite trained in modern subjects. And this sort of process is, is self-reinforcing. The more you have examinations which are open to broader and broader groups of people, the more you get broader and broader groups of people succeeding in that examination, you have a self-reinforcing process of expanding the ladder of opportunity and of changing the nature of the elite to include um, women, ethnic minorities, working class people. And I think this, system really reaches its apogee as a, as, a, as a transformational system in Britain after the Second World War with the 1944 Labour government dedicated to the principle of, of meritocracy, of, of the idea that everybody's position should be based upon their, their merit. And you see a huge infusion of working class talent into the elite as a result of that, that revolution. And I think you, you have more social justice as a result of this, more economic efficiency as a result of this, because society is increasingly drawing on the abilities of, the, of its entire population. And yet, despite this extraordinary progressive historical role that meritocracy has, placed, as has played, we see a mounting revolution against meritocracy or disillusionment with meritocracy at the moment. See it all over the place. Uh, you see it in Black Lives Matter, who is saying that this is just a system of racial oppression dressed up as social justice. Uh, you see it in, in, in broader social justice movements saying it's a, an instrument of patriarchy or it's an instrument of class rule or it's a disguise for cultural and economic privilege. And you also see it, strangely enough, on the right as well. You know, Trump, right-wing populism, 
Brexit were all revolts against the intellectual elite who supposedly look down on the world from their meritocratic heights and don't um, have the sense uh, of ordinary people about the way that the world ought to be organized. So we see a massive revolt against merit coming from every element of society and even from the meritocracy itself. So two of the most interesting books written about this subject, uh, apart from, you know, before mine, as it were, were uh, Daniel Markovitz's book on the meritocracy trap and Michael Sandel's book on the tyranny of merit. One of those people is a Yale professor, the other is a Harvard professor. So even within the citadel of meritocracy, we have this revolt. Now, I think there is a good reason for this revolt in that what we've seen recently is a marriage between money and merit, uh, a way in which people who are born rich and privileged um, reinforce their position by buying for themselves educational privilege, sending their children to the best schools, making sure that those schools are academically very, very um, rigorous. Uh, and there's been an extraordinary change at the top of society, I think, from institutions like Eton or institutions like Harvard being basically finishing schools for people from the right class background to those institutions being much more meritocratic, putting much more emphasis on grades, on achievements, on performance. So this marriage between money and merit is a problem. It means that the top of society, whilst thinking of itself as being meritocratic, is also becoming much more socially exclusive. And the question is, what do we do about this? The Markovitz and Sandel would say that we need to realize that merit is a bit of an illusion and we need to have many other mechanisms other than purely meritocratic mechanisms to, to, to secure social justice. I would say that what we must do is try and push forward the meritocratic revolution of the first half of the 20th century. Um, and we, the best cure for meritocratic underperformance is more meritocracy more testing, more educational selection, more um, schools that try and bring the benefits of um, academically rigorous education to poorer groups in society, such as the, uh, the academy schools, which we see right across East, the East End of London, which are doing um, extremely well in terms of getting children into, into elite universities. Um, and I would personally also argue that British public schools, i.e. private schools, ought to be compelled to offer at least half of their places to people who don't pay on the basis of, of, of pure academic scholarships. I would say that because I think meritocracy is a valuable thing um, morally, because I think it's a valuable thing economically, because it helps us uh, locate talent, but also because I think that we're not in this game all alone. We have competition from China, um, which um, has embraced the meritocratic spirit and is putting huge emphasis on set selecting able people from right across its population and training them in the economically useful subjects. And if we don't compete with China on this meritocratic playing field, if we think that we can loosen our own meritocratic criteria and have a society which is less meritocratic, I think we will lose out to China. And I think if we lose out to China, because China is using this incredibly powerful tool of meritocracy, um, the, the, we will be the poorer for it and the world will be the poorer for it because we will see a shift in the balance of power away from the West, becoming decadent towards China, using meritocracy to reinforce its, um, it, 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 its rise to greater prosperity. So meritocracy made the modern world. And indeed, if we're not very careful, if we allow meritocracy to slip between, between our fingers, it could unmake the modern world and see a new world based upon Chinese power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. That's um, a lot of food for thought there. And thank you for the, um, your initial remarks about the LSE being the home of meritocracy. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the LSE was started by Fabian socialists, among other things, because they're unhappy about the kinds of people and the kinds of procedures that places like uh, like Oxford and Cambridge had in place. Um, and it is not a coincidence that we are smack in the middle of London in an area which back then was not exactly posh. It was working class, um, meritocratic, competitive, and that's very much the, the LSE ethos. Let me ask you two or three questions. Uh, um, and, and let me start, if I may, with the sort of obvious pushback that you touched on uh, toward the end of your comments. Namely, yes, clearly, 
it is not your last name or it is not your uh, social origins that will get you into Harvard or get you into the LSE or into Oxford, but it is a bunch of other things, including money. Um, yeah. uh, and you're absolutely right that uh, just as the cure for lack of democracy is more democracy, maybe the cure for lack of meritocracy is more meritocracy. But that sounds good. It is not easy to do in practice because um, if you've ever been an admissions officer uh, at one of these schools, and I did that for many years at Harvard, you will soon realize, of course, that you're reading a bunch of folders and the people who look very strong in terms of grades and scores and tests, whatever, are the people who went to the good private schools. And then in turn, the people who went to the private schools are the ones who had privileges earlier on in life. And as a result, you know, simply insisting on meritocracy alone, uh, defined as performance in objectively measurable things like tests and grades and marks, et cetera, uh, will get you inevitably, you know, a, a draw from a little, tiny little sliver of society. Um, yes, you mentioned it is possible to have these academies and feeder schools, which, 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 which try to bring people into the Harvards and Yales of Princeton who might have not been there otherwise, but that's a very slow process. The truth of the matter is that, uh, uh, you know, this has been going on for 30, 40 years in the US and the UK and elsewhere. And it seems that we're going in the opposite direction that, uh, you know, it is, if you look at the people getting into schools, particularly in the US, they tend to come from families of, you know, professionals who live in certain zip codes and who went to certain schools. So is that enough? Do we need to do something else? Um, do we need uh, affirmative action of one kind or another, which may stand in tension with meritocracy? Well, uh, a, a big question there. First of all, let me just pick on Harvard um, because I think it's a particularly interesting example. And the easiest way that Harvard could um, become a, social, a more socially just institution than it is at the moment is obviously to become more meritocratic in the sense that it would stop discriminating deliberately in favor of people whose parents or relatives went to Harvard. Um, this extraordinary system of legacies right. I, uh, you, you have affirmative action in favor of people whose, whose parents went there or in favor of people, the children of people who teach there. So um, uh, that would be an easy thing to do. Um, but I think about 20, more than 20% of people go to who go to Harvard are beneficiaries of this system of affirmative action. I think you also have affirmative action, sotto voce, as it were, in favor of people who perform certain athletic sports. Um, which are, let's say, let's say rowing. I don't think there are many people in inner city schools who uh, do rowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and another system, all these athletic scholarships tend to be uh, scholarships which are in favor of people who come from privileged backgrounds. I would say that whatever problems there are with SATs, and there are problems with SATs, less discriminatory than things like personal statements, mm -hmm. which universities seem to put a, an enormous premium on. So I think it, just moving from the current system to a purely test-based or examination-based system would be one which would broaden the catchment era. I think. Can, can, can I stop you there? Because yeah. I think you're oh. right, but there's a big but, a yeah. big elephant in the room, which is, uh, and again, uh, uh, we need not focus on Harvard alone, but Harvard may be a good example, or Yale or Princeton uh, or Oxford for that matter. Yeah. Yes, there's a legacy business. Yes, there are the athletic scholarships. Suppose you got rid of all of that yep. and you uh, admitted people on the basis of grades and SAT scores alone. Uh, it is still pretty likely that the, those admitted would come from a handful of zip codes uh, uh, where there would be the children of professionals you know, who had lots of books and lots of social and, and intellectual capital at home who were privileged in some sense. And as a result, you know, yes, you would get rid of some people whose only attribute is that granddaddy went there, but you would still be drawing from a very small chunk of society. Well, I think the most dramatic impact of that would be that you would have a big increase in the number of Asian Americans, many of them, uh, the children of immigrants or themselves, in fact, recent immigrants. And I think that would broaden the socioeconomic catchment area. But the, the, the broader point that you're making, that social class background matters, um, is true. And that's why I would argue um, for um, 
a re-engineering of the whole educational system in such a way that um, you have earlier selection, you have people um, in the state system being siphoned off into academically um, challenging schools early in their careers. And just to give you an example of this, we had a system in this country called the 11 plus, um, whereby some children went to grammar schools and some children didn't go to grammar schools. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the social composition of Oxbridge colleges, it changed dramatically after the Second World War because you had more and more people coming in from grammar schools, i.e. selective state schools, mm -hmm. all the way up until, let's say, the, 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 the about 1980 is the cutoff point. Then when the grammar schools were abolished, the, number, the proportion of people at Oxbridge from public schools, i.e. private schools, goes up. So you get a historical regression. So you, you could um, use the mechanism of tests, IQ tests, selection of people, sending them to academically selective schools. And again, there is, there's one school in the East End of London, um, which has a catchment area, which means that most of its children uh, have school meals, um, free school meals, which is an indication of poverty. Most of its children come from ethnic minority backgrounds, um, but gets more children into Oxbridge every year than Eton does, one of these the, the sort of academies. So I think it's quite possible to create intellectually rigorous demanding schools populated by people from, from, from uh, poorer backgrounds um, and to change the nature of the elites. And what I, one of the things that struck me most in writing this book was that meritocracy um, and the idea of opening opportunities is constantly expanding the pool of talent and enriching the elite institutions, mixing people from different backgrounds in these elite institutions right away up to the 1980s. And then it starts going into reverse. And I think it goes into reverse for two reasons. One is that elite institutions, private education institutions, become more meritocratic. So schools like Eton or Andover in the United States stop being just finishing schools for posh people, right. start putting an enormous emphasis on academic excellence. And at the same time, a lot of state schools become less meritocratic because they're um, taken up with an ideology of progressivism or egalitarianism. And what really worries me about this revolt against meritocracy that you see in people uh, going on, particularly in the United States, is that you're closing down the remaining elite public sector schools. So Lowell, Grammar School, Lowell School in San Francisco, um, which used to be an academically selective state school, mm -hmm. has just now decided to select people on the basis not of their test performance, but of a lottery. The same is happening in Boston Grammar School. Mm -hmm. the same the same will happen in the New York elite schools yeah. if de Blasio gets his way. So mm -hmm. that's the way forward is to reintroduce intellectually selective and demanding state schools starting much, much earlier. Because once you're dealing with 18 year olds, you mm -hmm. yeah. fairly fu fully formed people. I think it needs to be done earlier on. And I would again claim an intellectual legacy going back to the web. So we're incredibly keen on this, on this idea. Let, let's stay for a minute on the subject of elite state schools, which I think is fascinating. Yep. As you point out, many countries, many, in, many in, in, in Western Europe, certainly in the US, many in Latin America. Mm -hmm. I, I, I come from Chile. There's one school right. called the National Institute, which is you know, founded at the same time as the country was 200 and some years ago, which has produced more presidents and more ministers than, than, than any private school in the country. However, the case that critics make runs something like this, and I, yeah, I'm sure you know it, but I'd like your reaction. In education, peer effects matter. If you take students from humble backgrounds, you take the very good ones, you put them all in one building, maybe they will actually have beneficial uh, impact on one another. You'll get you know, a cadre of very good people, but their presence will be sorely missed elsewhere where in other public schools, or you know, public schools in the American sense, state schools in the English sense, which will lose a very good students, and therefore you will end up with a class division, call it within the middle class or within the work, working class, the very top students will disappear into the Harvards and the Yales and, and the LSEs and the Oxfords, and the remaining public schools will 
will, will stagnate and suffer. And as a result, you're creating a different kind of inequality. I'm not sure I buy that case, but I think it is a powerful case and, and worthy of merit. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, I think if you've got, the peer effects do matter, but I don't think it's, there's also a sense in which able people need other able people in their close proximity in order to achieve their full human dignity and human worth. And if you take an able person and put them in a class with less able children or less able teachers, they will tend to, to give up on education. They'll say, well, this is not for me because it's not challenging. So I think that's, that, that the system of selection, which gets people of roughly the same ability and puts them together in a class um, is beneficial to those children. It's also beneficial to other children because there's nothing more discouraging than having yeah. in your class who finds everything so easy that they can't. What so happens think, to the kids in those schools well, who lost the leading yeah. lights that once upon a time attended those schools? Because I, th I think that one of the great problems with English education is that we had a system of um, selection by elimination. And so basically you either did very, if you did really well, that's all that mattered and everybody else could be cast by the wayside. And I think we need desperately to replace the system of selection by elimination with selection by differentiation. And we need to make sure the ideal is a system whereby um, ability, opportunity and challenge are, uh, are matched to each other as much as possible with the proviso that ability is very randomly and widely distributed in the population. But also another important thing to say, there are lots of different sorts of ability. They, you know, it's not just academic ability that matters, it's caring ability or technical ability or engineering ability or your ability to, 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 to make things. Uh, so we need a wide range of different schools for a wide range of different abilities. And I think that, you know, it's not just a matter of raking up a few people who happen to be brilliant, and making sure they go to the top schools. It's a matter of having a wide range of different institutions catering to different sorts of abilities. And I also think there's, you know, particularly I'm thinking about Britain here, we have a terrible snobbery about vocational and technical education, whereby, and we have a terrible snobbery about caring professions, whereby they're not given the proper sort of dignity that they, they deserve. And I would say that uh, I would point to the German system as a much better system in the sense that lots of different skills are and lots of different attributes are um, admired and given status. But I would say even the German system is not enough because a huge amount of what matters in the future will be the caring professions as we have an aging society. Um, and we need to some way of giving more status to, to the caring professions. So selection by elimination to selection by differentiation, but also um, selection by selection, I think is a way of matching your individual characteristics and abilities to, 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 to your opportunities and to your, to your teaching. But I do understand your, your mm -hmm. point that, that um, cadres form, which tend to be self-perpetuating and we need as much as possible to break up that self-perpetuation. Let, let's turn uh, to the, I don't know what to call it, moral or philosophical side of, the, of this debate. Uh, yep. As I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we had Michael Sandan pre presenting his book in an event much like this one uh, a few months ago. Um, and one point that Michael makes stuck with me, which is about the arrogance of the cognitive elites. Uh, I'll, Forgive me if I make the point in connection to my own experience. I'm, I'm a dean at the LSE. It turns out my father was also a university dean. So maybe uh, I could get very arrogant by thinking what a great merit it is that I made it here. But somebody could say, well, you simply got lucky. Your father was a dean. Your mother is a lawyer. There are lots of books in your house. There's no great moral uh, merit. Uh, it is simply a random and lucky uh, draw. Uh, Sandel's point is that uh, we are living at a moment of a strong anti-elitist sentiment. That's what fuels populism. And that, of course, uh, the elites may be to blame because uh, there's a certain arrogance that comes from believing that you deserve that. Uh, and it is not, uh, as Michael puts it, a just dessert. You just happen to, you know, if you're very tall, 
you, you got lucky and you're good at basketball. If you grew up in a house full of books, well, you got lucky and you're probably good at reading books and writing books. Um, is there not, first of all, a moral danger and secondly, a political danger associated with meritocracy? There is a moral danger and a political danger associated with what I dub in my book, Pluto meritocracy, which is this marriage between merit and money which allows the cognitive elite to entrench itself at the top of society. Um, I would say there are two ways of dealing with that problem. One is an intellectual way and one is a practical way. The intellectual way is for people to understand that about 50% of the thing that makes them good at what they do intellectually is genetically determined, is inherited. Mm -hmm the result of them being good people or hard or hard-working students is because they've won a genetic lottery not all of it not all of it but about 50 percent of it they just happen to be lucky and people who are lucky um, owe a moral responsibility to society in general to give something back so i would say that um, i don't believe that that, that pe 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 people who are academically successful have no claim you know they've worked hard mm -hmm. They've, they, they, they've done their dues. They've, you know, given up all sorts of temptations and, and in order to get their books. So they have a moral claim to some sort of reward, but mm -hmm. also happen to have been born clever. Right. And that means that so, so it's, it's, not a, it's not an all or nothing. Yeah. But they, they, they need cognitively to understand that they need to give back because they're winners of a genetic lottery. So I would say that's that's part of um, my responsibility. But the practical part but, but, is but before you I would say second half. Can I can I just uh, can I just stay with that for a minute? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the case for meritocracy is is a liberal case. Yes. And liberals tend to think that uh, simply telling people to behave better is not very effective. They need to have incentives to behave better. So you're absolutely right. There's no great moral desert associated with being tall or, or, or being bookish. Maybe it is just a lucky draw. However, if every incentive in society makes you feel great and tells you that you are wonderful because you got that ticket to Harvard or to Oxford, uh, then um, can, can we expect anything else from people except that they will get cocky or that we will get cocky and arrogant precisely because uh, presumably, although not effectively, we are so good? Well, I think that, 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 that we're, we're, we're sending very powerful signals to people right. that, that this is a dangerous path to go around. I mean, what was Brexit about? Or Trump? Precisely, uh, precisely. We, we are, in a sense, exactly. becoming uh, a more chastened elite and, a, uh, and, and, and an elite that, that understands, to some extent, the fragility of its position. I would say even more than that. I mean, the system of redistributive justice embodied in the income tax right. and in, inheritance tax is all based on the principle that you owe something back to society um, for being lucky. But I would say that the second part of my formula helps a bit to address this, which is I think one reason why the elite has become so cocky and arrogant and divorced from the rest of society is it's because it's worked out ways of preserving its position. Opportunity hoarding. It thinks that it can pass its privileges along to its children. It has a good chance of doing that. Um, and I think we should make it more difficult to, for the elite to pass their privileges on to their children by using, you know, much more rigorous educational selection, by using uh, much more objective tests, by abolishing legacy scholarships, by, by mm -hmm. abolishing the system whereby if you do internships for very powerful organizations, you get a big, big mm -hmm. up. So if we made society more competitive and if we made the likelihood of downward mobility for our children much greater, then we would be less arrogant. We might be more anxious, we might be, uh, but we'd be a lot less cocky. So I think opportunity hoarding and mm -hmm. go along with each other and addressing opportunity hoarding does something to, to, to for, for people to realize, you know, there's a lot of luck here um, and um, we could all of us have family members who um, move into different positions in society because they're, mm -hmm not as cognitively privileged. I'm going to take the liberty of asking one last question, and then we're going to yeah. open it up uh, to questions from the audience. And I, I want to start with a philosophy. Uh, sorry, I want to stay with the philosophy. Yeah. There's a book in Spanish about meritocracy you probably haven't come across um, by a Chilean philosopher, a guy called Peña, Carlos Peña. 
Uh, and the book is entitled The Noble Lie. And his point is <laughs> that um, it may be a lie that uh, I deserve to you know, be uh, complimented because I got into Harvard. Um, there's no great moral merit. However, this is his point. We human beings need to believe that because first of all, it gives purpose to our lives. And secondly, it induces good behavior in a world in which otherwise people will run amok. So might it not be that meritocracy is not so good as a way of allocating rewards, but it is good as a way of creating this necessary lie that tells us, oh, I am deserving of what I get, therefore I will play by the rules? This is an argument to some extent about, uh, about incentives, but I, yeah. my view is this merit, as Michael Young, who in, invented the term meritocracy, the great sociologist invented the term meritocracy in 1950. He says that um, merit is IQ plus effort. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that we fully deserve um, educational success, if that's what we get, because it's a lot is a matter of genetics, but we partially deserve it. I think we partially deserve it because we are, you know, studious, because as I say, we don't go to the parties, we, 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 we work. So it's not just a noble lie, it's a true description of rewards for efforts. So I think 50% is, is, luck, is the luck of the genetic, but 50% is the result of self-discipline, of labor, of hard work. And that's why I believe that to some extent, people yeah. who are educationally successful, deserve some sort of income preview. So and, and I, I, that, of course, we have to believe that in order to encourage good behavior. But I also think it's a reasonable belief, belief, unless you're going to argue that the ability to work hard is also genetically determined. And then you get such a reductive principle that yeah, yeah. has any agency whatsoever. Yeah. No, I, I wasn't going to argue that, but I was going mm -hmm. to argue that, that there are lots of studies out there that show that those non-cognitive abilities, self-control, punctuality, yeah. effort, discipline, are also the kinds of things that you pick up from your parents if your parents had them. So it is, to some extent, reproducing privilege anyway. But in any case, um, yeah. let's open it up uh, to some very good questions that we have received from the audience. Um, we have 21, and we're only going to have time for three or four, so I apologize in advance to, to people who've put in questions. Um, let me begin with the following by um, Yazan Dugan, who says, your analysis seems to assume that we already agree on what counts as merit. And one of the distinctive features of the current backlash against uh, uh, meritocracy is precisely that people disagree on the nature of merit itself. Um, to, to oversimplify, um, the question says, it is not simply access to Harvard or Oxford, but rather the question of why Harvard, why Oxbridge in the first place? Aren't you assuming too much, Adrian? Well, first of all, I would my my answer to that question would be to some extent read my book because <laughs> it is um, a long history of how notions of merit have changed over time. And if you go back, let's say to the 18th century uh, and to the Enlightenment, when people talked about merit they were really talking about a combination of virtues and talents. And they meant by talents, a wide range of abilities. And they meant by virtue, you know, moral virtues. Moral virtue um, was as integral to their notion of what merit is about as um, intellectual ability or artistic talent. So uh, that was a very broad ranging notion of merit. The notion of merit then becomes very much narrowed down in the late 90s and particularly the 20th century, and identified more with abstract intellectual ability, people's cognitive ability, their ability to, to process um, information and things like that. So there is a long and fascinating, fascinating history of different conceptions of, uh, of merit. So um, I fully accept that the notion of merit is, is, is a pliable uh, one and one that's changed over time. However, I do think there is a fundamental break historically, um, which, which is that the break is that being given a job should be related to your ability to do that job. And I think in a world that is defined increasingly by knowledge um, and uh, cognitive ability in a world which you know, is essentially a knowledge society, 
I think the merit that comes from cognitive ability, um, reasoning power, is something that employers legitimately place a very, very high value on. Uh, and so I think that um, although broadening the conception of merit might have some virtues, I think the danger, and I think this is a danger that Michael Sandel in particular um, understates, the danger is that the old world of privilege, nepotism, fixing things, making exceptions um, comes back in the form of social justice or in the, or in the form of um, broadening your conception of merit. So I think having a fairly rigorous notion of merit tied in the case of many, many jobs to abstract cognitive ability is a good way of avoiding a very bad thing, which is favoritism. Thank you. I'm looking at the questions here. Lots of good questions. Uh, here's another one from Kishan, who's a policy researcher in East London. And he says, what do you think of the experience of northern European countries, which do not have as many tests or exams as, as for the children as we do in the UK, but which enjoy some of the best social mobility nonetheless. What are they doing right? What is the UK doing wrong? Well, I, th I think that the, the, the system in, in, in European countries, I think northern European countries, I think differs. I think Finland does have um, quite a reliance on surreptitiously at least, uh, sending some people into academic schools and other people into vocational schools or academic and vocational streams. So I think there's a lot more testing going on, as it were, behind the scenes than it might look on the surface. I think the Swedish educational system is far from ideal, actually. They've had a huge range of problems. Uh, De Denmark and Norway probably better than ours. But I would say if we look at our particular set of experiences, um, the dramatically, the, the, the period in which we get a significant regression in social mobility mm -hmm. on educational performance is the comprehensive period, the comprehensivization period, and the rise of academies, uh, such as the Brampton Manor uh, Academy in, um, in, in East London, which are just beginning to, to come back, is doing an enormous amount to improve uh, social, uh, educationally determined social social mobility. So I think that the, 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 the truth is that the, the Scandinavian system is, is more varied and complex than that question presumes. And the historical experience of Britain is that getting rid of a focus on examinations in the secondary school sector has, was deleterious to social mobility. Might it not be, Adrian, and this is not a question from the audience, but this is something yeah. that, as the parent of children in school, worries me a lot that a focus on testing, testing, testing takes the joy out of learning. I've been appalled at attending teacher conferences with parents in which teachers simply tell you, focus on this because there are so many marks in this question and not so many marks sure. in the other question. You know, as, as, as a professor, uh, I worry a lot about that. Shouldn't we worry sure, about I think that? There's, I, I, I do worry about that. And I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of truth in that. And I think our system is too worried about uh, about all of these things. But that's because as a society, we are too fixated upon academic and intellectual success. And we don't have the ability to recognize that there are lots of different sorts of talent, including technical talent, and as I said, caring talent. And we do need to move from selection by elimination, as it were, selection by differentiation. I think the problem is less marked in Germany. It's particularly marked in Britain and the United States, and it's particularly interesting in the United States, because the United States used to have a broader conception of merit. And also because we have a very stagnant economy at the moment, everybody's worried about um, their how, how well their children will do. But imagine if we got to a system, in it, what I'm basically trying to say is that this obsession with testing is, is, is a symptom of a broader set of problems, a symptom of uh, social anxiety, coming from social, social stagnation and a symptom of an overemphasis on one form of success. And the way to do this, to deal with that problem, is not just to say, well, think a bit uh, less about tests, because I think that anxiety will come out in, in, new, in new ways. Actually, that, that uh, 
uh, it's a very good way into the next question I wanted to ask from Andrew, the PhD candidate at UCL. Andrew says that he agrees with this, you know, distinction between selection by differentiation and selection by elimination. However, in order to, uh, you know, to get over the snobbery that discriminates yeah. against technical and caring roles in the UK, uh, those careers would have to pay better. Uh, so as long as they pay badly, well, it's inevitable that people will remain focused on, on the exams that will get you into the jobs that pay well. You know, what, what is the economics behind this? And, you know, he, this is not quite the way that the, the question uh, uh, words it, but I think this is the main point behind it. Sure. What's the economics of making sure that people in the technical sector and the caring sector actually get paid enough so that it becomes attractive to go there? Well, the caring sector is is, is is a problem because it's for it involves such a large labor force and has such a long tradition of, of, of low pay. Um, but if we look at the academic sector versus the vocational sector, I would say that as a society, we are overproducing people with academic qualifications to the extent that they're not getting jobs appropriate. It, they're not getting the getting that much of a material reward for, for their academic profession. People who are successful do, but a large number of people are not getting much of a wage premium for those academic qualifications. On the other hand, we have a great shortage of people with vocational and technical education. Indeed, the market is signaling mm -hmm. more and more of these people. People are making decisions which are not justified by markets, by market signals because of a surplus of snobbery. As, uh, essentially educational snobbery. So I think if you, I think this is beginning to change actually. I think that the, the, the number of people going into, in, into technical education is probably going up, but you still have the sense that it's second best. And that's not something you have in Germany. And you have people who go and get technical educations. And one of the reasons they do it is because it gives them access to well-paid and very stable uh, careers, and we have a shortage in this country of of, of engineers and um, of technically trained people, and we have a surplus, as it were, of liberal arts people who spend their life as barristers rather than as barristers, as it were. Uh, yeah. Well, the economist in me wants to say that, um, you know, with regard to the caring sector, as we age and there's more demand for care. Yep. Demand will outstrip supply, and the wages in that sector will tend to rise. So maybe there's an underlying economics force that will deal with one of the problems. And I so the rain, the sort of care we tend to associate care with um, jobs which are quite um, physically intensive, um, just looking after old people. But I think a lot more jobs will become much more uh, a matter of, inch, uh, 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 of emotional support and will be very sort of demanding in terms of the sort of skills. So I think you will get a high skilled caring sector uh, developing, um, okay. which will, 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 will demand extensive training and will lead to much better remuneration. All right, we don't have a lot of time, but there's one big subject we have not properly addressed, and I'm hoping we will next. Uh, uh, and it is a subject of discrimination, of bias. Mm -hmm. Implicit in much of what we have said in the last 45, 50 minutes is uh, the notion that uh, if you work hard and if you're good and if you study, well, you get, uh, you'll get rewarded. Many people, of course, would say that's not true. Um, you get rewarded if you're a white male. You, maybe you don't get re rewarded otherwise. And there's a great question here by MB Christie, who says IQ plus effort minus bias is the proper definition of meritocracy. As a professional woman for 30 years and an LSE grad, I don't think mer meritocracy works for underrepresented groups. I think it's a very powerful and important challenge, uh, Adrian. What's, I, I what think your reply uh, to that? Well, my, my, my first reply to that is that I'd love to ploin that uh, formula because it's an exceptionally good formula. I like it uh, very much. Um, let me say a few words in favour of the meritocratic revolution because I think the meritocratic revolution has, by its nature, um, reduced bias over the long term. Um, much against the wishes of many people who set up the system in the first place. So when the system 
was set up when the system of open competition moderated by examinations was set up in the mid 19th century. It was set up by very well educated men who thought that it would be a system which would produce more people like themselves. And then along came uh, women and said, well, wait a minute, if you believe in open competition, moderated by examinations, why can't we be part of that system? Um, and so it was sort of self-reinforcing and a self-radicalizing principle. So in 1892, there's this marvelous story of a woman called Philippa Fawcett, who sat for the Cambridge Mathematics Tripos, which was the, regarded as the most intellectually demanding of all academic subjects and physically demanding because it required you know, enormous stamina to do it. And she got the top mark in her year. And so she was ranked. The, the, the person who gets the top mark is called the senior wrangler. But because she was a woman, she wasn't officially allowed to do the examination. So she was given the mark above the senior wrangler. So what that indicates is that if you set up a system, um, it be can become self-reinforcing. And even the people who set it up don't fully understand where it's going to go. And meritocracy did indeed go towards a system whereby many, many more women <coughs> Uh, came up through the system and many, many uh, more women became senior wranglers and did extremely well in the system. Now, more than 50% of people going to uh, elite uni well, university in Britain are women. Women are, uh, have got large number, uh, lots of lots of elite positions uh, in the civil service and other professions. Mm -hmm. And not something which was created, which is something that was created by the logic of meritocracy, or I remember when I was at Oxford back in the late uh, 1970s, suddenly all the male colleges became single sex. And the reason they did it is because they realized that, they, that the male college wouldn't be able to compete for the best males or females unless they became um, co-educational. So in competing for the best people, they were forced to get rid of these old restrictions and, and become more fully meritocratic. So I would say that meritocracy has a sort of self-radicalizing um, element to it. I think the same was also true of the working class, that you know, schools that, or institutions which were prejudiced against people because they came from the wrong social background or, the, or had the wrong accents, lost out mm -hmm. and uh, defeated in the competition for talent by other institutions. And so meritocracy sort of by its nature is constantly looking for, for the best people. Now, this, this doesn't mean that the bias doesn't still exist. It does mean that bias tends to damage the institution that remains, that, 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 that supports it. Now, there is certain groups of people who for historical reasons have been um, excluded from positions, and I would say this is particularly true in the United States, of the African-American population who were enslaved um, and who were then subjected to systematic prejudice, ranging from Jim Crow to redlining, from being forced to live in the worst areas. And as a result of deliberate policy on the part of the state or states, were uh, subject to... Uh, you know, patterns of discrimination, which resulted in not just being poorer, but having lower collective uh, average educational performance. And I think in those cases, then there is a very strong moral case for affirmative action to certain people being deliberately excluded uh, and deliberately oppressed by society, then society has an obligation in the long term to make up for that oppression through affirmative action. Um, Let's stay something like, I'm very reluctant the, uh, to that because I, I, as a liberal, I think people should be judged as individuals rather than as groups. But if groups have been discriminated against, then society also has an obligation to make up for that discrimination. But let, let's stay with the issue of affirmative action and special measures. No. One case is one of sort of compensation, which is the one you just made. But another case is simply one of uh, effectiveness, meaning... Yep. It may not be that the progression of merit is inevitable, as you suggested, because you know if you if you choose the wrong people, your company or your institution will 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 stay behind. 
Uh, it may simply be that um, there are no such incentives and the people with the privilege are the one who keep getting the good plum positions. As a result, for instance, we see that in company boards or top company management in parliament in most countries, racial minorities or women, you know, after many, many decades are still very much underrepresented. Um, are you comfortable? I, mean, I am, but I'm wondering whether you are with a notion that, for instance, we need quotas in parliaments or quotas. Oh, I wouldn't want to have quotas in parliament. And I, I would say a lot of the underrepresentation is, is, is quite interesting in Parliament at the moment because we've seen an enormous increase in the number of women in the British parliaments. I mean, it's not fully representative of the population, but it's still gone up fairly relentlessly. At the same time as we've seen uh, the representation of people from man the manual working classes virtually disappear. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, I think, when we were talking about the, the political yeah, yeah. Of, uh, uh, of having a cognitive elite running the country. I think that is a terrible problem, you know, because we have a parliament which is not representative of the range of uh, employment experiences of the population. So uh, I'm much more worried about that than I am on, on, on yeah. the, the, the woman issue, because I think the woman issue will naturally take care of itself. If you look at uh, the trend, historical trend, if you look at yeah. educational trends, uh, if you look at the the the, the um, uh, the way that Parliament is slowly, but it's now beginning to, yeah. to deal with maternity issues, I think we will move towards a position in which women will not be, be informally discriminated against. I think there's a lot of informal discrimination against working class people. I'm, I, I'm a little bit less optimistic than you are. I, I cannot think of any one country where, say, a national parliament is 50% women unless that country took corrective measures like quotas. But before we run out of time, let me just ask one question, yeah. which I think sort of summarizes the whole debate, and then regrettably, we'll have to call it a day. Uh, Duncan actually, who actually wrote a book called The End of Aspiration, quotes a book, not his own book, but, uh, but Selena Todd's book called, I'm sure you know, it's Snakes and Ladders, The Great British yeah. Social Mobility Myth. Uh, and Todd says in that book, uh, and, and Duncan uh, quotes the book, that uh, meritocracy goes wrong in assuming that we're stuck with a hierarchical society. In other words, meritocracy gets you to the top because there is a top. Can we not aspire to a society without hierarchy, without a top in which there's well, more equality? Well, we could aspire to it, but I would say that most societies and most social movements that have put equality in the very strong sense of the word of equality as their aim have not um, obviously, communist societies, Cuba, Russia, uh, and the rest of China, Mao's China, which have aspired to a very strong notion of, of equality, have produced horrendous uh, outcomes. I would say that you will get a natural, uh, and I, I would say that you will get a system in any um, advanced industrial society of a very significant degree of hierarchy in any uh, institutions which require a coordination of a great deal of activity, you will get hierarchy, but also in any knowledge organization such as the LSE, you will naturally get um, hierarchy. I can't conceive of a sophisticated modern society that could do away with hierarchy. And as I say, historically attempts to do that have led to um, abomination in the form of mechanism is most obvious. Yeah. Perhaps differentiation is a better word for that phenomenon than hierarchy, but 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 I see your point. Um, I wish we had more time. Uh, I feel that we've just sort of scratched at the surface <laughs> of the issues, and these are fascinating issues. I suppose in closing, I should say that uh, for those interested in 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 in, in going deeper, um, here's oops, here's the book. If, I don't know if people can see it. The marriage. Oh, there we have it. And on the screen, the aristocracy of talent how meritocracy made the modern world. Adrian, we are past our time. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to the LSE, presenting your books, discussing the ideas in the book uh, with us, with our students, with our community. Um, and uh, we hope to uh, have you visit in person one of these days. Thank you very much. Very enjoyable. For everybody who joined today, thanks a lot. And uh, please do join us at another LSE uh, virtual event soon. Good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.